I'm here probably because of one person, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. <laughs> Not like that. Uh, at a Shabbat dinner years ago uh, that I was invited to, um, I sat next to Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And I was at the time leading Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. And she found out that I had served in Iraq. And she turned to Ellie and a group of other people, and I'm not going to do my Dr. Ruth accent. Um, but she said, you have to take them to Israel. You have to take them to Israel, and you need a GI Bill, she said, which she was right about. And we went on to create and pass the post 9-11 GI Bill, which if it succeeds like the first one did, will be one of the greatest returns on investment for the American taxpayer in American history. But Dr. Ruth was right. And she introduced me to Eli Elephant, and he took a group uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, one of the first groups, to Israel. And we experienced Israel, and we built friendships. I think more than anything else, the friendship that I've had with Eli is reflective of the friendship that exists between so many American veterans and so many Israeli veterans, and so many American people and so many Israeli people. And my goal now in this phase of my life is to try to add light to contrast the heat that's happening in this country and around the world. And I hope that this conversation tonight and this panel in particular can do that. We're coming from many different backgrounds, but tonight we're here out of a sense of community and I hope we're here out of a sense of action. And the two men next to me are men of action. They are leaders in their industries and I think voices of clarity and conscience for this country in this important time. Mike is a, is a new friend. We've just met tonight, but I know many of his, his team, and I know of his good work. He's also a Ar former Army helicopter pilot, U.S. Army helicopter pilot. And Ambassador Ginsburg and I go back, I believe, 20 years. I was honored to meet him through uh, a mutual friend and great mentor of both of us, the great Les Gelb, who many of you may know. Um, but he's been in my corner and in our corner ever since. And he's an incredible voice and a much needed voice in this moment. This is a moment, including Israel and Gaza, but even far beyond, and especially in America, where we're being called to action. Our generation is being called to answer this moment, each in our own way. And these men are doing it, and many of you in this room are doing it, and I hope more of you in this room will be doing it afterward. But I want to start our conversation, Ambassador, I'll start with you. Um, because you've got seniority over the chopper pilot, with all due respect. No, sir. I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, Thank you for your service. I defer to you. You're, <laughs> you're both recently back from Israel. You're both recently back from Israel. So I'll, I'll leave the question to, to both of you. Why did you go? What did you see? And what do the people in this room need to know about what you experienced? Sir? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for your service. And thank you, everybody. Look. You know, you all came here tonight uh, because you're dedicated, but I want to give you something that Joe Richards taught to so many young college students over the years to strengthen their Judaism. We're going to give you fuel for truth tonight, okay? Uh, those of you who participated in, that, in Joe's, Joe Richards' inspirational program understand what I'm saying. Look. I was, uh, my family emigrated to Israel when I was eight years old. I was raised in Israel for almost 10 years. My family helped found one of the northern kibbutzim, Mizgavam, on the Lebanese border. They've been all dislocated as a result of what is taking place. I spent so many of my years growing up standing shoulder to shoulder with my brother Michael who was the head of the military and security operations for the Northern Galilee before the 2006 war in which he was killed. Okay. I went to Israel a few weeks ago because his son, Eli, my nephew, who, is the, who just resigned from the directorship of Israel's Special Forces Academy, who is an Israeli Navy SEAL, who is a special forces commander and commando. On October 7th, when the alarm went off in his home, he got in the car, despite the pleas of his wife and his four children, to rush to Kibbutz Reim to galvanize whatever he could gather from his troops and his squad to begin trying to rescue hostages. 
two hours into the operation, Eli was killed. Okay. Israel lost one of its bravest soldiers. When I say one of its bravest soldiers, it's almost at this point in time hard to comprehend that at that time, this great man who was my nephew and who was the son of my brother who lost his life was married to a beautiful young woman who 20 years ago married my nephew's best friend who was also killed in Gaza 20 years ago. I had to go back and to help my family out, to be there with them to see what I could do to, be, to stand with them, to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder. Because over the 50 years that I've worked in the US government, I've spent most of my career in the Arab world, as well as in the West Bank, and yes, indeed, in Gaza. And the one thing that I've come to understand from all of my years growing up in the Arab world, that it is critical for Israel and for American supporters here in, Israel, here in the United States, that, this, that what is taking place in Israel today is not just the result of four months of conflict. This is an existential threat to Israel. And Israelis who are not part of the military, who unfortunately uh, who are just sitting home and dodging rockets and worrying about their friends and their uh, relatives who are called up in the Miluim, in the reserves, and who are worried up north that every time they wake up, their homes could be destroyed as a result of Hezbollah rocket attacks, and who are worried about whether Israel will be accused uh, in a few days in the whole court in The Hague of genocide, and can imagine if that ruling comes down, even if it's provisional, what that means. And all the anti-Semitism that, that we see back here, if there ever was a time where the people of Israel needed to know that American Jewish support will not waver in the face of all of what you and I are enduring. And I see it every day because my work right now, I founded a nonprofit dedicated to fighting uh, social media anti-Semitism. We go in and we rat them out and we find them and we interdict them and we isolate them on social media, okay? It is something that I did helping the Jordanian government fight ISIS. And so my experience goes back deeply in social media. I founded the first Arab language television production company after 9-11. Spent most of my career in the Arab world as the first Jewish ambassador to an Arab country. So my loss, our family's loss is deep and abiding. But I, but I know that I'm not alone. Think of all the families in Israel right now who are suffering. Think of all the military in Israel right now who, after f almost four months of war, are looking to make sure that this strategic relationship with the United States is not undermined. In Washington, there are letters being circulated by Democratic senators who claim to be friends of Israel. The one of you put conditions on aid to Israel right now. Inexcusable. Joe Biden, President of the United States, has done more in the, so far as what the Israeli public thinks than any president. Had he not flown to Israel and stood by them, and this is not meant as a partisan uh, uh, advertisement, but when I was in, in Israel, the Israelis, every Israeli I knew said, thank God for him. Had he not sent those aircraft carriers, who knows if Hezbollah had launched more attacks. So let me close on my introduction and say, folks, we don't know what's going to happen if there's going to be an escalation. I could game it out for you one way or the other. But when the folks who founded Shields of Steel did so on the cusp of a conflict, they understood how critical it is to not let Israeli hubris get in the way. Oh, we're OK. We'll be OK. No. The big brother right now is not the Israelis. We are the big brother and sister to Israel. And God bless you for being here tonight. Thank you, sir. Well. Um,
<laughs> you, I told you you should have gone first. Uh, I should have gone, I, I should have gone first, listen to the old guy. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here and, and a little, quite frankly, a little embarrassed um, uh, sitting up here in front of all you guys that are working so hard in this cause. Um, why did I go to Israel? Uh, it's kind of simple in my way I think of things. You really can't be a New Yorker and raise your family and live here without being a little bit Jewish. Um, my kids have gone to more bar mitzvahs than they have birthday parties. Uh, and I say that kind of joking. Actually, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is marrying a Jewish guy. He's the first Jewish Novogratz. Uh, he doesn't know he's changing his name yet. But, um, and you know, you work on Wall Street. You know, you develop great friendships. Jeff A uh, is a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, we work together. Uh, we've been friends. And uh, right after the uh, the tragedy, uh, I have a gospel brunch. I have a gospel brunch every eight weeks because I like gospel and I like putting a diverse community together. And we celebrate. And I asked Jeff to come and and speak at it. We usually have we have Martin Luther King Jr. speak at it. Uh, we've had amazing, you know, preachers and. Jeff became the preacher. And he said something at that brunch uh, that resonated. And the first time I'd heard it was from Ahud Barak, actually, who had become one of my buddies. He said, you know, even me with Holocaust surviving parents uh, who grew up really Jewish, you know, uh, I never understood what it was like to wake up and thinking people want to kill you just because of who you are. And I thought, I was a cute little Catholic with blonde hair and blue eyes, and no one ever wanted to kill me. And it was really hard to understand that. Um, what struck me even more is you know, our choir was all black. And uh, a lot of gospel singers are black. And, uh, and one of the women had learned the Israeli anthem and sung it so beautifully. And people were weeping. And my Jewish friends were coming up to me and hugging me and saying, we really needed this. And, what I realized talking to these young, beautiful black singers is none of them knew there was a history between the Jews and the civil rights movement. Right? They're 22, 23, 24. They didn't know that Heschel and King were thought partners. Um, and so when I went up and I was talking about them, they all came up and thanked me for that, that knowledge. And I thought, this is so interesting, same city, this lack of knowledge. I learned something yesterday, which was horrifying, that if you go to the Martin Luther King Museum in Montgomery, uh, there used to be this great picture of him walking across the bridge with Heschel to his right, and now they've now crapped, cropped Heschel out. Uh, true story. Um, and, and so I thought to myself, you know, Jeff invited me to go on this trip. You go because he was my friend, because Larry Evans is my friend, because Ben Tish is my friend. And so I really went just to be an observer, to be a witness. Um, a lot of, we had a lot of good jokes. Uh, I, front, I fronted the money for, for uh, the tickets, and I thought that was the first time maybe in history that a Catholic paid for 12 Jews to go to Israel. <laughs> um, they, they all paid me back with interest. Uh, um, but it was a fascinating uh, trip. I had first been to Israel in 1987. Uh, I was in the Gaza Strip uh, literally a month before the first Infantata broke out. Uh, I was talking to all the young kids who kept telling me about their grandparents' home that they needed to go back to. And I would say at 22, uh, a middle class kid from Virginia saying, guys, I, there's, there's hospitals on that property. There are hotels on that property. There are apartments on that property. You guys need to kind of take this or do something else. And I think that's been the core of this tragedy that has gone on. There's a group of people who have always wanted to return. Uh, there's another group of people that have built an amazing community there. And no one's able to bridge that. I, I, I spent, I feel like I was connected to this story even though I wasn't Jewish because of my first trip and then I followed it and became friends with Ehud Barak. He, he had worked on our hedge fund. And, and, and so I, I have followed this trip very emotionally, not, not nearly as emotionally or, or, or physically as any, any of you. Um, and so I went there thinking, shit, this has gotten more complicated, not less complicated. And I at least want the ammunition. Uh, to come back to the United States and engage in conversations with firsthand experience. And you know, thanks to Jeff and Eli and Ellie, I'm sorry, and, and, and everyone else, we, we, we had an amazing uh, experience. Uh, painful. Uh, I have 50 employees in Israel, and uh, 
I addressed them at the very end of the trip and you know, broke out to a, a puddle of tears. And I was thinking to myself, I've been in business for 35 years and I've had a lot of employees and I've never cried uh, like a baby in front of all my employees. And uh, in that last night in Israel, we had watched that film and it all kind of came to me at that same time. And, and I, I tell that story not so y'all think I'm a crybaby. Uh, I tell that story because even a guy who was one step removed, who thinks of himself as tough, who had served in the army, who was a wrestler, uh, what we saw uh, cut to the core of humanity. It cut to the, the most painful parts of, of who we can be and who we are. Uh, and so to me, that was powerful. The, the other side of it, and then I will, will throw, the, throw the mic back, is I saw an amazing resilience. Uh, Israel's greatest strength uh, to me was the IDF. Uh, people were so disgusted with Bibi, disgusted with the government, frustrated with all leadership, including the military leadership, but they had faith in each other. And I went to the reserve unit. My, my CEO uh, immediately, you know, having not been in the reserves for six years, rejoined as a in a drone unit and he got me somehow into this top secret clearance and I was meeting all these drone, drone pilots and watching them fly their missions. And it was shocking to me where they had all come from and how they were all working 50, 60 hours a week as drone pilots and still running their companies and doing their jobs. Um, from the young people to the, to the older people, uh, I was like, dudes, you do not want to pick a fight with this group. Mm -hmm. uh, and that Israel's hope and this is survival and the, and the thriving that you're going to see literally comes from that citizen army. Um, what has been frustrating as a cheerleader and an observer is it was pretty much unanimous. If we talk to the left or the right, old or young, you know, military or non-military. You know, one of my friends, uh, Gigi Levy Weiss, is the leader of the big protesters, Brothers in Arms, and uh, talking to him there was a unanimous decision or, or belief that Netanyahu needs to go, that you need a change of leadership, and that would happen soon. And now we're 75 days, and it hasn't happened. And I think it's a huge missed opportunity. Israel is losing the PR war globally, and that would help a lot. And, you know, politics are politics. They dig back in. The, the factions start calcifying again. And so I think it's a big big problem and a big opportunity, big missed opportunity for Israel, because I think things need to change. Um, I was saying I, w I wear this, uh, we got these from brothers in arms or brothers and sisters as they now call themselves, uh, and I see a lot of you wearing them. Um, and if I wasn't a wrestler, I'm not sure I'd wear this on the subway uh, or on the street. You know, you, you, the, the, the PR battle is being lost, and so I don't have the answers to that. I just sense that, and I do think there's things that can happen. The battle, sorry, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. The battle for hearts and minds is at least now often more important even than the battle on the ground. And I remember many things about our first trip to Israel. And I remember being in a, in a, in a nightclub late in Tel Aviv because Ellie took us out. And we had a dozen or so American veterans, and I think every bouncer in Tel Aviv was former IDF and hooked us up. So we were in a room not lit much differently than this late one night, and we were having an amazing time, and we were treated with respect and love, but there was something different in the air. And, and I said to Ellie, I was like, this is there's something here. Like, there's so much energy and positivity, and, and people are partying their ass off. And he said, you party your ass off, too, if you thought you were going to die every day. And I remembered that. And I also remembered at different points, it happened a number of times, we'd go into a trip or we'd go see a store, and someone would look at me, and they'd look me in the eye, and they'd say, don't forget us. That was 2009. And that left a mark on me. And, it, and we didn't forget. And we don't forget. But we're also in a city that forgets and a country that forgets. I was at Ground Zero after 9-11 and was frustrated oftentimes by how many of my friends were overseas fighting and dying and folks were here living life uninterrupted and watching the Kardashians. In the back of the room, there are plates that you can put on and experience 
what it's like to wear body armor. And you can see a metal pla a, a, a ceramic plate that's got 772 rounds in it, what it looks like to get shot in your chest wearing a vest with, by an AK-47. That's what it looks like. In my 20 years of advocacy, I've fought to try to bring the power of place to people, to help people never forget, and especially Americans who, frankly, get pretty tired of our own wars pretty quickly. For both of you, because you're also both experts on America and American culture and American business, sir, how do you bring the message home to America now so they never forget what's happened and they appreciate the gravity and the magnitude of what's happening now? Paul, uh, and it's a compelling story. Uh, two comments. I dedicated my life to understanding Israel's enemies. Uh, in 2016, I went to Gaza, was put in the trunk of a car blindfolded to go and meet with Hamas's leadership in Gaza. And the purpose was, and, and for someone, I mean, I was a novelty, raised in Israel, American amb uh, ambassador, speak fluent Arabic, uh, and, have, and spent most of my career working in the, in, in, in the Middle East, in Arab countries, not in Israel. And I wanted to hear, like I heard from Arafat, like I heard from Mahmoud Abbas, like I heard from almost every Arab leader, uh, a Palestinian uh, leader, including all the Palestinians who were in, whose names were in the paper, what is your fate when it comes to Israel? Are you going to ever favor a two-state solution or a two-stage solution? And right now, my friend Tony Blinken is on a mission to try to resurrect in the rubble of what essentially is Gaza some pathway and exit ramp for Israel out of this conflict. And of course, Israelis are not prepared at this point in time to even entertain the idea of a Palestinian state. But we here in the United States tend to forget that what is taking place in the region right now is lost on so many Americans. To them, this is binary, black and white. When I talk about the high school students or the undergraduates who have been given a corrupted education in binary oppressor versus oppressed, and when I spend my life online with my team, looking at the anti-Semitism that is on the social media platforms, I keep saying to myself, where is my cavalry support here? All I see are the worst sons of bitches, anti-Semites, online from Truth Social to X to uh, all the fringe platforms. And I keep asking myself, where is the American effort to challenge these people up front? What are you afraid of? You need to dive in deep in order to refute them, to challenge them, to do what is necessary to take the fight. And if you need help and directions, I'll spend all the time in the world that you may need for me to spend with you to show you how you can take the fight to the enemy. When I see these bastards disrupting uh, Jewish synagogues and trying to disrupt Congress and trying to disrupt this with names like Jewish Voices for Peace. And now if this Hague Tribunal gives them ammunition to, to in effect even legitimate provisionally that Israel is committing Jewish genocide, it's going to be even more critical for us to stand up. The battle right now is on social media, okay? And we need uh, if there's going to be shields of steel that is providing the necessary armaments to the Israeli military, we need shields of steel back here to get more into the fight to refute our adversaries here at home. So I'm going to take a little different, different approach. Um, yeah, I'm a macro investor, uh, so I travel a lot and try to understand trends. So one of the big trends that was happening in the Mideast is it's getting wealthier. 
And as people get wealthy, right, Saudi is got vision 2030, Abu Dhabi, Dubai are unbelievably wealthy and unbelievably more powerful, Qatar. They like nicer stuff. Uh, they don't like suicide bombers. They don't like protests in the streets. They like Chanel. Um, I, I, was in, I was in Abu Dhabi the week before I went to Israel, and uh, you know they built this beautiful Louvre museum, and there was an exhibit with the oldest Torahs in the world, the oldest Korans in the world, and the oldest Bibles. Right? They have the Abrahamic Center. Mm -hmm. And so let's not forget that three weeks before this tragedy happened, everything was moving in the direction of legitimization of Israel and peace. And so I, I don't think we should forget that there's a side of the Middle East that just wants this to go away. And so Israel's got to figure a way to de-escalate this at one point. Uh, again, if it's getting rid of BB, there's lots of things that can happen. Uh, and just go status quo and let that support Israel. But if enough shit on the ground keeps happening, they're like, I, I, can't, I can't touch this. Uh, and so I think it, it's hard. You, know, you couldn't even have these conversations for the first six weeks because the fire was so red, the, the anger was, and, and, and justifiably so. Uh, from what I saw, uh, you know, you, 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 you couldn't even have a rational conversation with people. But it's time to be more strategic. Um, because you do risk, Israel does risk, and the Jewish community does risk losing this big battle, right? I mean, I'm talking to, 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 to friends on the other side who are like, you know, Nelson Mandela was a, uh, was a, a terrorist until he wasn't. And I was like, oh, stop, stop. Like, you know, like, uh, but that, that's the narrative that is picking up a, a lot of steam, and I think it is very, very dangerous. And so I do think the desire to, I mean, the, the original goals of, of the, 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 the state of Israel was eliminate Hamas, get back all our, our, our hostages, um, right? There wasn't a then, what, what Gaza looks like. Hood Barak did a great interview, uh, and he's my buddy, so I'm, I'm biased, and he said, guys, I don't know if it's 15 years from now, 20 years from now, five years from now, the two-state solution is the only solution. And ironically, the map won't look that different than the one I try to draw with Arafat. Mm -hmm. When I was there in 1987, I swear on my life, I sat there with now King Abdullah, who was a prince who didn't speak a word of Arabic, and my sister Jacqueline, and we drew out that same peace plan. It's the only intuitive one, right? Uh, and so in some way, you're going to get back there through a lot of pain, and, but it's going to take time. And so again, I'm not an advisor, my thought is that's where Israel has to move. You should be, you should be the advisor. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, I, I don't, it, it's not easy, and it's, you know, but I do think it, 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 it's time for the de-escalation. And I know it's, it, that, that sounds like, oh, I just don't see what else uh, works. A lot of the work that I do is about trying to talk to people who are uh, without a voice in the political process. I host a show called Independent Americans, and I think it's often forgotten that 49% of this country is politically unaffiliated and independent. And I talk and think a lot about how they're a political jump ball, especially this year. Most of this country is not extreme right or extreme left. Most of us are somewhere in the middle and moderate and trying to work toward solutions. And I, I think there's definitely an opportunity to create a more clear articulation to the world of what the future looks like, whether it's done by the Israelis, the Americans, or somebody in this room. But I remember going into Iraq and them telling us the objective was to take out Baghdad and get Saddam. And everyone said, great, what's next? There was no plan for what's next. And now it feels like there's somewhat of a public discussion happening around what's next. And you and others are going to drive that. So, as a final part of this, of this discussion, um, vigilance is the price of democracy. And each of us in this room has, a, I think, an obligation, a requirement to be vigilant in our own way, 
not just with regard to this issue, but in this country where extremism is now the number one strategic threat to our national security. So for both of you, um, what, should, what should people do in your view? Here in the room, yeah, and anyone who feels like maybe I'm not a political person, I want to be involved, and, and as a part of that, a piece I think you, sir, especially can articulate, why does this matter to American national security? Beyond our friends, beyond the other components, why is this a strategic priority for America's national security? It's a great question, Paul. And uh, you know, now I'm going to show my age. Uh, I was Jimmy Carter's deputy advisor for Middle East policy on Camp David. I go back to 1978, working on this issue. You look good. <laughs> Will you recruit me? <laughs> I worked on the, on the Palestinian autonomy negotiations. I worked uh, for Bill Clinton uh, on Middle East issues. I worked for Al Gore uh, as his national security advisor. There hasn't been a peace process from Henry Kissinger all the way through to Joe Biden where I haven't been asked to give my views or to commentate. And it always goes back to a two-state solution, OK? And, 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 and so, many, so many hours and days and months and years, I call it the Middle East military diplomatic industrial di uh, complex, OK? Because whole careers have been spent trying to unwound this Gordian knot. When Yitzhak Rabin was prime minister, I was ambassador in Morocco. He had signed the Oslo Accords on the White House lawn, and there was this great hope of expectation in the Arab world that finally, finally, we have now created the roadmap to peace in the Middle East. Okay? The assassin on the far right that killed Rabin that assassinated him knew very well. Killing Rabin would kill the peace, okay? And Israel itself has to come to terms about what it believes is its best hope for no more war. Eradicating Hamas may have been a lofty goal. It's hard to eradicate an ideology with a population that has been raised on a diet of hate, okay? It is very hard to convince West Bank Arabs, whose brethren they have enormous empathy for, but who do not want to be brought into this conflict any more than they already have. And here at home, there are Americans who are fatigued. Ukraine, money, arms, Israel, arms, money. And Americans are asking themselves, where, what is this all about and why is this about us? Why do we care about Ukraine? Why should we care so much for Israel? And or people in this audience have spent so much time defending the strategic alliance between Israel and, um, and the United States. And I'll close with this. I travel and speak to, try to speak to mostly non-Jewish audiences, Knights of Columbus around the country, organizations like that because I want to convey to them the sense of why, whether they live in Arkansas, where my wife is from, or in Oklahoma, I try to go out to the hinterlands several times a year to address audiences. And the one thing that people lack is that they don't understand why what happens in Israel matters to them at home. And when they have someone who and develops a certain empathy and credibility and explains to them our only democratic ally, the importance of Israel's technological partnership with the United States. The list goes on and on. People begin getting it, but right now, the one thing that I haven't seen, and I monitor this, on local television stations, and, I, and I'm talking about the national networks, and I'll finish right here, Paul, is not enough supporters for Israel being interviewed on local televisions. There are very few people when there's uh, anchors who are not educated, uh, who need to be brought into the, um, into the fold. I would encourage 
any organization in the Jewish community who can do this, to begin inviting anchors to engage, to undertake and participate in Zoom calls, uh, to, be, to be more educated about what's going on in, in the conflict, and to bring experts on. And that would be my best advice, because the anchors and the producers in the local networks are the ones who are deciding whether to bring the story to you or not. Thank you. Mike? So, you know, from a, an American perspective, I think there's a, a different way to think about this. Um, I had this in my own company. I had, you know, a Pakistani woman that worked there came to me and she was really, really suffering. Um, no one's caring about these kids being killed. And so she was on the other side of this uh, and felt, and then I realized, okay, we have seven, eight, nine Muslim employees out of, a, out of our 400, a lot more Jewish employees that's in New York City. Um, but I thought, well, how do I get these two people who are broadly both suffering? The Jewish employees were, were, were suffering immensely. One woman, you know, she'd been married to a, a non-Jew for 20 years, and not one of her relatives called and asked how she was doing. And she was just like, I just, like, this was my family. They didn't even call me. Like, so there was this painful suffering on both sides. And I was like, guys, let's just sit down together. You guys sit down together. I don't need to be there. And I realized that, I, I think about this all the time, I was like, the blacks, the Jews, and the Muslims are three of the, the groups that are disliked just because of who they are painful to say. People dislike blacks because they're black. They dislike Jews because they're Jews, and they dislike Muslims because they're Muslims. Uh, I think if you ask the heartland of America if they could hit a button and have all the Muslims disappear from America, they'd all hit the button. Uh, that's not great. And so in, in lots of ways, there's a lot more in common than there is differences between those three subgroups that right now feel like they're at war. And, and that war, that emotional war, is happening because of Jews are perceived to have a tremendous amount of agency, and they do have a tremendous amount of agency. Wealth, communication, media, uh, the other subgroups don't have near the agency. And so there's a, there's a nuance you've got to have that conversation with. But to me, how guys like me can help is trying to, I mean, I spent all day yesterday with two Muslim friends just trying to talk them off the ledge. I was like, dude, you're just missing this completely. And, and finally, I got them at least to just calm themselves a little bit and say, yeah, yeah, never, th never thought of it that way. And so I do think this, this is a, a hard and a long-term game. But I do think that, that insight, which is not such great insight, that, that the, the, the groups that are discriminated against are often the ones that are fighting each other uh, in the press. And, 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 and there's something there. Uh, listen, New York City is tremendously important for the Jewish community. Uh, it's the second largest Jewish city in the world. Uh, it is home to, well, it depends on how you measure New York City, but to, to millions. Uh, uh, and I do think your work here in outreach to the rest of the city, I think Mayor Adams early on gave a great speech. I haven't heard much since, but I do think, you know, keeping this bastion of support uh, is also really important because the city has a lot of influence and a lot of power, and you know, it's it's just like the rest of the world and the rest of America. There's a have and have nots, and it's fraying, and so I, I do think there's a lot of work to be done right here as well. Um, leadership is required in moments like this, and it comes in so many different forms. And uh, I want to thank both of you for your leadership, for your candor. And a lot of what I've learned about leadership is showing up. And you're showing up here. You're showing up every day in, in your own way. And many of you are, are showing up maybe for the first time tonight. Maybe you've been showing up for a while, but Etan's out there somewhere. And he is like so many kids around this country right now and around the world looking to us for leadership. But they're also part of it. So we're counting on you too, big guy. But we have to set the example. And I think so many of us have set the example by being here tonight. Um, and I would ask you to continue to lead by example uh, in this city, in your own way, in your dinner table, in your business, in your congressional office. 
But this is going to be a moment and a time that will challenge us all, and every one of us has an opportunity to be a leader. You're going to hear from more leaders in the rest of this program. Uh, and next up is my friend Joe Richardson, who's going to, who's going to share with you uh, and introduce some other speakers who can share their experiences and provide more leadership. But we're honored to be here. I want to thank Ellie again for his leadership. And please join me in thanking these panelists for their leadership. Thank you. 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 Thank you.